This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. And we're going to begin this segment. And we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about what's happening here locally and, of course, happening throughout the nation. You know, since our last broadcast, we've had our first cases of uh, the coronavirus here in North Texas. And, you know, Thomas, this is very serious uh, information that we're going to be talking about today in a couple of segments that we're going to talk about. But it's the right thing to keep people informed, also hopefully to keep them from panicking. You know what, I I think to set this up, just because so much news has been disseminated all over the place, Steve Love, who you're listening to, is the chairman and the president of the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. You guys don't have any idea how many boards and contacts and meetings and strategy sessions and high-level stuff he's been involved with this past week. Have you slept? Have you even slept? Yeah, I've slept, <laughs> I've, I've slept a little bit. But, you know, it's been kind of fun. There's so many good people in the community. You know, our, our county health directors, those folks have just been working and working, our county health departments, our hospital people, the teams in the hospital, uh, support groups in the community. You know what? We're going to get through this. And it truly does take a community. Well, the wisdom and the knowledge base from which you are filtering the information that we're going to talk about here is from a very high level because it is rare to get this kind of access to somebody in your position. So thank you for making it available. Yeah, it's, it's fun to do. It's good to do. I'm sorry under these circumstances it's warranted, but we want our listeners to have the very latest. We want them to be well-informed. And we want them to make informed decisions and not panic. You know, one question I had as the week unfolded is originally, and we've talked about it on here, keep prudent, be careful, etc. Then this week, after you saw the changes, even before the pandemic declaration, you were saying we need to shut down big crowds. What shifted? I think the real thing is listening to the experts. Uh, listening to the infectious disease physicians, listening to our county health people, listening to people that know about how this virus could spread. So that's why we got on board with, let's look at large crowds. Let's look at things we need to do to distance people so that we can move towards prevention. You know, it's one thing to have to treat someone who has this virus in a hospital. But it's another thing if we can prevent it so they don't have to be treated in a hospital. Well, and speaking of, so one of the big headlines that I know has flashed on every phone in Dallas-Fort Worth this past week is how packed all the hospital beds are going to be and all this and how the hospitals are going to be overrun. And this nationally now, not not about DFW. I'm just talking about this is one of the big headlines. Well, you know, uh, that could possibly occur. Let's hope not. Here in the North Texas area, our hospitals are working together. We know the bed capacity. We certainly uh, anticipate that there will be more cases. We understand that. But I think if we can get on the front end of this and we can help prevent and we can get people to do things that would help at least slow the spread of this, hopefully we won't get in that critical surge situation that some people are predicting. Let's see if we can prove that prediction wrong. What is the number one fear or issue that people in the Metroplex, from your opinion, broadly are facing right now? I think many are facing the fear of, have I been infected? And a lot of people want to go and get tested. And that is just not the right approach. You need to consult your uh, personal care provider if you are exhibiting the symptoms, if you meet the criteria if you know you've been exposed, and talk to your county health department. But you should not immediately jump to the conclusion, oh, I think I have been infected and I need to be tested. We don't want to use test kits unless it's medically necessary to do so in the opinion of the clinician that's examining the patient. What about these containment zones? Are we ready for that yet here? 
You know, I'm not saying we're ready for containment zones, something like what you're talking about in New York, but that is the value of testing. Because if you have testing done and you can look and start to see patterns, if you will, or zones, then from that information, you could deploy what's needed to contain it. And what is the test kit status now? I think uh, we have test kits. I think that, that they're out. All of the county health departments are working collaboratively together. The hospitals, as you know, LabCorp and Quest are now involved in testing. So I think that the approach we're using through commercial, through county, is going to work to get the tests done that are needed on a go-forward basis. I would bet last Sunday, if I had asked you what would you expect between now and next Sunday, that you probably wouldn't have painted the picture of what actually happened. But as you've been looking at this and kind of crystal ball gazing and thinking about what might be next, what do you see as next and might possibly happen this coming week? You know, it it is hard to say. I think you're going to see more schools look at spring vacation. You're going to see probably some schools that may actually shut down for a period of time, and that has ramifications. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But you may see some businesses start working more from home. There are a lot of things, I think, that potentially other what I would call professional athletes that may start playing in empty arenas or may cancel the rest of their season, similar to the NBA. But let me go back to schools. You know, we've talked about social drivers of health on this show, and our school officials are really to be commended. Not only do they do a great job of working to educate our students, many of these students, the only food they get to eat is at school. So if schools are closed, they may not get that food. So a lot of our schools are working with other community organizations that if they have to close, how do they deploy food to many of these children that need that food? And I think that is so important. Even some of our universities, community colleges, have food banks and have food kitchens. We cannot take our eye off the ball related to social drivers that are impacted by this virus. And you know, if there was anything that came up this week, it might be along the lines of those social drivers, like you were talking about. Absolutely. And you know, look at the people that are homeless. Look at many of those people, if they got infected with this virus, how quickly it could spread through that population. All right, coming up on this program, we are going to talk next to Dr. Allison Lydell from Presbyterian Hospital Dallas and get an infectious disease perspective on this. And then we have an interesting segment coming up in segment three on how to handle this from a psychological perspective. We're going to have Sandy Potter from Texas Health Resources, who's going to update us related to stress and anxiety. And then we're going to end this show on a high note over in Fort Worth, and that will be a surprise toward the end of the hour. The Human Side of Healthcare will be right back with coronavirus coverage right here on News Radio 1080 KRLD. This is the Human Side of Healthcare on 1080 KRLD and the Radio.com app, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. Welcome to the Human Side of Healthcare. We are going to continue our discussion today related to the novel coronavirus COVID 19. We've got Dr. Allison Liddell, Medical Director of Infection Prevention. And she is an infectious disease expert, serves on the medical staff of Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital, Dallas. Dr. Liddell, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Things are changing. We know that this is a very fluid situation. But from where you sit as an infectious disease specialist, how would you view the situation here locally? Are we kind of like the rest of the nation? Are we different? What is your view locally? We're different because at this point, we only have a small number of cases. There are several cases in Collin County, several in Dallas County, and in Tarrant County. 
Uh, So we know that the virus is present in our community, and we do know that it has been passed from person to person in the community. Um, But there aren't an extensive number of cases. So we still have an opportunity to utilize not just things that we do here in the hospital to prevent infection, but also in the community, things to decrease social distancing, to cause, uh, sorry, to create social distancing uh, so that we're decreasing the spread of the virus. We're not going to eliminate this from our community immediately by any specific action. But the idea is that there's an epidemic curve. So there's, imagine a graph where the number of cases goes up and then comes back down. Um, if, if we are able to decrease the rate of transmission, so the speed at which people get infected, then we decrease the height of that graph and it, slow, it, it causes fewer people to be infected at any one given time. And that is a, a lower burden on our healthcare system, which is already becoming really kind of inundated from this. So, so that's, that's the reason for a lot of the, the uh, restrictions and the cancellations that are happening, to try to decrease the rate of spread so that we can manage this already here uh, at pandemic in a better way. So we hear a lot about stay away from crowds, please be careful when you sneeze and cough. How do you really get infected with this virus? The virus that causes COVID-19 is spread by a couple of different ways. So one is it's spread by touch. So if someone sneezes and contaminates a, a doorknob or a surface, and then you touch it, and then you touch your nose, then you can become infected with the virus. It also can cause droplets in the air, that's also from a sneeze, that can become aerosolized. So that means they can float around in the air and you can breathe them in. So that's why it's so important, first of all, that we wash our hands frequently. Every time you clean your hands, you're eliminating virus from them. So if you have just touched a doorknob and then you clean your hands, you've eliminated it. It's also important that we not touch our nose and our eyes as frequently as we all really do. We don't realize we do it, but we need to be conscious right now trying to wash our hands and not touch our noses and our face. And if we do, wash our hands again right after. So those are very important things. People talk about wearing masks, but hand washing is by far more important. And also this idea of social distancing that I mentioned before. So none of us like disruptions, but this is, this is not a typical situation. And we all, I think, need to understand that there are going to be disruptions. There already have been many disruptions. But this is the time to be thinking maybe more about the greater good than about these individual short-term disruptions, trips that can be rescheduled, and other plans that can be rescheduled. It is a big deal, and we can all do our part and should. You know, as you look locally, nationally, we canceled a parade. We heard about people in Hollywood that have contracted this virus. Some schools have extended their spring break. Some schools are talking about closing. There's so much going on. There are basketball tournaments being canceled. Are we overreacting? No, we aren't overreacting. These are mechanisms that have been in place for decades related to prior epidemics and pandemics that are tools that are utilized by our public health system every time there's one of these pandemics. So so these things have happened before, and this is not the first time, and they're important. We need to be able to, as I said, slow the rate of transmission so that we have fewer people sick at any one time. I think this is important, and I don't think anyone is overreacting. You know, I've heard people say, and people have even called me and said, you know, we dealt with Ebola in 2014 here in North Texas. Are we better prepared than other parts of the country, in your opinion, because of that? Well, I don't know if we're better prepared than other parts of the country. I think we're very well prepared. I think we learned lessons for definitely during that, but not during just during that time, but during the previous H1N1 pandemic and the SARS-CoV pandemic earlier in 2003. Uh, you know, this isn't the first time that our, our healthcare system has, has dealt with a pandemic. So sure, the Ebola experience was uh, was informative, but this is a very different situation. It's a very different virus. The Ebola virus is Uh, not transmitted the same way, and the Ebola virus has a much higher mortality rate. The COVID-19 virus is uh, spread very, very easily from person to person. It has a much lower mortality rate. So these are just very different situations and require different strategies. Right. So Dr. Liddell, our listeners, if they think they're sick with this virus or they really think 
that they may have been exposed to this virus and they're very worried, what should they do? Well, that is a great question, and there are a lot of things they, that they can do. First of all, if you're feeling sick, you should contact your healthcare provider for advice about next steps. If you're not feeling sick, then there are many places to get information. For example, my organization, which is Texas Health Resources, has a website, texashealth.org, that has the number for a hotline that we have for the community to answer questions and many other things on that website to use for information. DallasCounty.org is another website that has plenty of information for the public, and they also have a hotline, and the number is on that website. And then finally, CDC.gov also has many sections, many documents, and recommendations intended for the general public. So those are all three areas that one could go to to answer questions. If you're concerned about a possible exposure and you're feeling completely well, the emergency room is not going to be the place to have that dealt with. Uh, It's much better to contact the public health authorities in your particular county or contact your physician or one of these hotlines and get some advice about what to do if you think you might have been exposed. I have had a nagging question. How do people succumb to this? Most of the deaths are related to severe lung disease. The virus itself has been shown to attack a certain molecule in the lung tissue, which is the mechanism for how it causes severe lung damage. So people literally die of severe respiratory failure. It also can cause severe heart failure, And then there are other things like bacterial infections that can happen secondarily, but by far the majority of deaths are related to lung failure or heart failure. Another debate, do hand sanitizers that you get at the drug or that you used to be able to buy at the (laughs) drugstore, do they work? Some have very low concentrations of, of alcohol or other disinfectants, so some work better than others. There are some clear guidelines at cdc.gov related to exactly which products are effective. Now, another thing that came out this week are these reports from some of the CDC spokespeople and others addressing Congress that are saying that so many Americans are likely to get this. Now, that was a change because we weren't hearing that until this week. Do you agree? I agree that many Americans are likely to get this. Another thing that's been in the news or been circulating is once you get it, you are immune to it. Is that true? It's true that you will have some immunity, certainly in the short term. It may not be lifelong immunity, and of course, it's a new virus, so we definitely don't know that yet, but but certainly people who have just recovered from the illness should have immunity to the illness and be unlikely to get it again. Typically, when we think of flu season, we think of what, April, May, and then we're kind of winding it up and moving on into summer. Does this stay with us? Hard to know at this point. It could become a, a virus that becomes a seasonal virus like influenza. But this is a new virus and this is a pandemic. This is its first (laughs) go-around. So it's hard to know how long this will last and and, uh, what the behavior of the virus will be once this initial pandemic is over. And minus a vaccination, would you expect it to be back next season? Impossible to know. The SARS-CoV virus, the initial one in 2003, has not recurred. Just from a personal level, is it spreading faster than you anticipated, equal to what you anticipated, or, or on expectation? I think when this first began in, in January, when we first heard about it, we hoped that it would be contained to, to the region where it started. Uh, but over the last few weeks, it has been clear that it's spreading quickly and, and, and because of global travel is spreading all over the world. So I think at this point, I'm not surprised at the rate, uh, but I couldn't have predicted this necessarily in January. But the point is, as you have said and implied, this is serious. Yes, this is serious. Dr. Liddell, thank you so much. We could talk for another hour on these topics, but I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule, for giving us good nuggets of information And thank you for being with us. Well, thank you very much. And we have more with Dr. Lydell on our podcast. Search for The Human Side of Healthcare on all your favorite podcast apps and look for the bonus section. There's a lot more great information that we didn't have time for here. Coming up next, have you felt stressed or angst about all of this? Sandy Potter from Texas Behavioral Health with some tips on de-stressing coronavirus as we all cope with this together. Next on The Human Side of Healthcare.
The DFW Hospital Council, along with our over 90 member hospitals in North Texas, are proud to bring you the human side of healthcare with Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. And welcome back to the human side of healthcare. We're going to continue our discussion around COVID 19. We're going to talk now about stress and anxiety associated with it. We couldn't find a better person than Sandy Potter, Vice President of Behavioral Health at Texas Health Resources. Sandy, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. You know, a lot's been going on this past week. The NBA suspended what they were doing. We've heard about some Hollywood folks that have contracted COVID-19. We canceled a parade. It goes on and on and on. Young people, they're not used to this type of thing. What about young people? Stress, anxiety, what do you recommend? It's very important to include your children and your family's plan for managing this crisis. This will lead to a better understanding. It'll counter all their fears and anxiety of the unknown. We need to help children and adolescents have a sense of control during times like this. We need to ask them what they've heard. That's a good way to start the conversation. And Frequently having these conversations, the way uh, the news is changing every day, we should be asking our kids every day, what have they heard? What are they worried about? Encourage them to share their concerns. Let us know. Let teachers, parents, trusted friends, let them know. Stay connected to your friends. This is a time where uh, online interactions can be helpful, not on social media, but perhaps through chatting or texting on your phone or having a, you know, a FaceTime type interaction with your friends. It's important that we encourage kids to continue their normal routine. We don't want to break the routine. We don't want to stay up all night. We don't want to stop doing the healthy things that we do every day. And as parents, we need to model healthy behaviors and not be sitting there watching the news all day long ourselves. So create family time. Be intentional about having the discussion every day. I think that's really critical for kids. Well, you know, Sandy, uh, that's great advice. Let's flip a little bit over to the adults. You know, some folks uh, staying at home if they're high risk, which is probably a good thing to do. There are some people that are kind of sequestering themselves And there are some people that are quarantined. When you're at home and you need to mentally relax, what do you recommend? Well, we need to remember that our home is our respite, and we don't want to lose that piece of being home and having rest. So even if you're isolated or quarantined, reminding yourself this is a temporary situation. Keep the family schedule, like I said, as consistent as possible Uh, especially when it comes to bedtime and any of the things that you do to take care of yourself, like exercise. If you can't leave the house, create your exercise routine as a family at home. That's a good way to keep uh, healthy behaviors. It's very important for adults to watch their alcohol consumption if they do drink, because during times of stress like this, people can lean on some unhealthy behavior patterns that make it more difficult to sleep and recover in terms of the stress of our days. You know, some people uh, got very upset when they heard the parade was canceled in Dallas. Other people got upset when they heard the NBA was suspending play. When we see friends or people kind of display anger or get upset, what are some of the things we can do or do you recommend that we help our family and friends when they're frustrated? And what are some of the things that we can do to calm them down? Well, it's super important to stay connected. There's a big difference when we hear about um, social distancing, big difference between social distancing and social isolation. Typically, we see people getting more and more agitated and irritable when they're actually engaging in social isolation. So when we see our friends getting angry and upset about some of the changes that are happening, just engage in the dialogue. Well, let's think of something else to do. And I think it's also important to ask, is that really what's bothering you? Sometimes people act like that when they're just scared. 
and a lack of information increases our anxiety and our fear. You know, this may seem like an odd question, but here we are on the radio and we've got listeners and radio.com and podcasts, but what do you think's a good dose of media? What's too much media? Do we overindulge sometimes? You got thoughts on that? Well, I do. I think right now you really do have to watch how much you're watching TV, uh, watching the news, and taking in information because there's a lot of good information and there's a lot of bad information. It's well known that the more we watch news about stressful and traumatic events in our environment, the more stressed we'll be. So really, how much news is too much news? Pay attention to what your body's telling you. That's the healthy thing to do. If you find that you're getting more and more stressed, think about, well, what am I doing differently? You'll probably notice you're watching or listening to the radio and the news more than you were. I keep my routines, um, and I think that's important. Think about what you were doing before this event and keep that routine. Like, I listen to the radio news all the way to work. That helps me relax on the commute. So I think it's important, just monitor your own feelings. It's especially important, though, to put limits on the media and social media with our kids and and young people in the house. So pay attention to what they're doing because they will, they're not as skilled as us, um, hypothetically, I like to say, in managing their emotions. So tune in to what they're doing online. You know, you made some good points there, especially on social media. You work in healthcare. I work in healthcare. We've dealt with these kind of situations before SARS, MERS, swine flu, et cetera. Sometimes, unfortunately, on social media, everything that's out there is not accurate. So when we talk to our friends and family that don't work in healthcare, Do you have any nuggets of information or suggestions on how we explain to them what's going on, but at the same time, keep them calm? Sure. I mean, I think the key there is a lot of anxiety is produced from inaccurate or a lack of information. So reiterating to our family and friends that we're going through a crisis right now. We need to modify our behaviors. There's some simple things we can do that will reduce our own risk. And a lot of times, uh, perception drives anxiety as opposed to actual risk driving the anxiety. So think about that. It's how we're perceiving what's happening in our environment that shapes how we're reacting. And I think allowing people to talk about it providing the education, the support. People are going to call you. People are going to call me. They're going to say, what's really going on? I just reiterate the simple information on the CDC website. Wash your hands. Practice social distancing, which means, you know, don't shake hands. Do your greetings from at least three feet away, hopefully six. And stay away if you're sick and stay away from people who are sick. For our listeners, especially those that are a little anxious, a little concerned, worry about what the future is going to be, what would be Sandy Potter's words of wisdom to them as we face this? And we are going to get through it, but what do we need to do now? What does Sandy Potter think? Well, I am a big fan of getting relaxation into your daily routine. Even if you can only take three minutes to exercise some mindful breathing. And if, if you don't know what mindful breathing is, there's some YouTube videos that you can just listen to for free that just sit, walk you through a three-minute mindful breathing. Uh, especially when we're talking about a respiratory virus, I think it's healthy for us to practice the deep breathing. Pay attention to your body. That's the most helpful thing that we can do besides just keeping up with the healthy things, getting sleep, eating right, exercising, and keeping in touch with our friends. Social connection 
is what we need to continue to do. You know, I was talking to Thomas the other day, and he got a call from a friend. And the friend was upset because his child was running a fever, and it actually attended one of the schools where there was an individual that there is uh, a concern may have in infected other people. What would you say to that parent? Well, obviously, I don't want to minimize what we're going through right now because it's very serious. But we need to remember, this is flu season. This is allergy season. We've been told that allergies are at an all-time high right now. So a lot of the normal things that happen to us every spring are still going to happen to us. We're still going to get scratchy throats. We're still going to get runny noses. We're going to have a little cough. Pay attention. Take your temperature. And only if you get a high temperature, that's when you should really consult your PCP. Sandy Potter, thank you so much. Words of wisdom to us. Our listeners need to stay calm. We're going to all work together. We will get through this. Thank you for being with us. It was a pleasure. Yeah, Sandy, we really appreciate it. Now, when we come back, we are going to go over west to Fort Worth and not talk about coronavirus. We're going to talk about a very special distinction that Fort Worth has. Yes, the Blue Zone, and that's going to be a great way to end our show because Blue Zone is about healthy living, healthy lifestyles, and we are so appreciative that we have a Blue Zone city here in Texas. That's coming up next on the Human Side of Healthcare. We're continuing our conversation on how you can empower yourself to have the best health possible in today's ever-changing healthcare environment. This is the human side of healthcare with DFW Hospital Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co-host Thomas Miller. And welcome back to the human side of healthcare. Steve Love and Thomas Miller here. And today we're going to talk about a topic some of our listeners may not know about. But it's very interesting and it's very informative. We have on our show today Mr. Matt Dufresn, who is Vice President of North Texas Healthy Communities. It's an initiative by Texas Health Resources to impact North Texas communities. In other words, they're going outside the walls of their hospitals to reach into the community. Matt oversees the Blue Zones Project which is an effort to implement practices and policies that support longer, better lives. Matt, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me. You know, many people in the community, many of our listeners, many of the people that will hear this on our podcast may not know exactly what Blue Zones projects are. Can you elaborate a little bit? And then how did it come to Fort Worth? First of all, Blue Zones Project is a community-wide health and well-being initiative, and it's really focused on making healthy choices easier in all the places, what we like to say, live, learn, work, and play. So the places that we spend the majority of our time. And it's based on the original Blue Zones, and these are places in the world where people live much longer lives and, I think notably, also much lower rates of chronic disease. So studies tell us that um, our health and well-being, our longevity is determined basically about 20 to 25 percent by genetics. So that means that the other 75 to 80 percent is really determined by our environment, the behaviors, our socioeconomic factors. So the bad news is that we can't change that 25 percent. But the good news is that we can change that other 75 percent. So Blue Zones Project focuses on changing that 75% by taking lessons learned from those Blue Zones, these places where people live much longer, healthier lives, and we apply those same principles in our local community. And really what we try to do is focus on changing the environment around us to better support those behaviors. So what we know is most people spend about 80% of their time in the same places. Think about your day as you're uh, waking up, going to, to work, your kids are going to school perhaps. You go to the same restaurants, you sort of go to the same grocery stores. So our approach is how do we change those environments to better support behaviors? So to that end, we implement those evidence-based best practices in work sites, schools, restaurants, grocery stores. 
neighborhoods, and even faith communities. And again, it's all about changing the environment in a positive way where people are spending their time. And Blue Zones Project came to Fort Worth in 2014, really through a collaboration of Texas Health Resources, um, the City of Fort Worth, and the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce, and of course, many other partners and funders. But it's really about collective impact, cross-sector collaboration, and this whole idea of public-private partnerships. And we now have 350 approved organizations and many other organizations that we've worked with over the last six years now. You know, Matt, you brought up some excellent points. And as I was listening to your response, I think it's important to reiterate something you said. What did 75% come from that affects your health? Well, again, that 75% is really about the environment that we live in. So the world around us, our homes, our neighborhoods, sidewalks, all of that. Socioeconomic factors. Do we have access to food? Do we have access to um, resources to even um, doctor's visits? And then also our behaviors. Obviously, that's a big portion of it too. But how we live our life, those things comprise 75% of what will determine our health and our longevity. You know, that's terrific. And it, you are so correct in making a positive impact on the community. And I know that firsthand, and I'll tell you why. Fort Worth was the largest city in Texas that did not have a comprehensive smoke-free ordinance. And because a lot of the work done by Blue Zones and a lot of the leadership of Mayor Betsy Price, Fort Worth last year became comprehensive smoke-free. And I know that's an integral part of Blue Zones. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. And we, we certainly played a major role in that. And I'll just add to that, that uh, you're exactly right, that we went from being the largest city in Texas not to have a comprehensive ordinance, but to becoming one of the first that really led the charge of in, including e-cigs in terms of that, that comprehensive ordinance. So I think Fort Worth has certainly changed its perspective on coming from you know behind in terms of health and well-being to really now being a leader and other communities are seeing us as a model of what can be done when a community collaborates together between healthcare systems, community leaders, elected officials to really say, we're gonna take a stand and improve the health and well-being of our community. You know, if our listeners that may not know a lot about Blue Zones, you're the only city in Texas that's Blue Zones, correct? We are. We are uh, very proud of the distinction that in 2018, not only have we been working to become a Blue Zones community, but we were became a certified Blue Zones community in 2018. That was really a recognition, not only of this broad impact that we've had, but also noticeable improvements to our health and well-being. Um, and, and really, that's um, a measure of the Gallup um, National Health and Well-Being Index Survey that tells us objectively we're making, a, making great strides in terms of improving the health of our citizens, our residents, and everyone that lives works and plays in our in our community for many of our listeners when they hear you describe how you are improving uh, the community the health of the community and the name of the show is the human side of health care so we really want to focus on that but to the people that say okay Matt you've been at this since 2014 what kind of outcomes have you really moved the needle well, I'm always excited to talk about that because I think we've made some great strides, but let me start about where we've come from. Um, we've annually conducted, again, this Gallup National Health and Wellbeing Index. So we are able to compare ourselves against our historical selves, but also against the nation and against other large metro areas. Um, in 2013, our baseline survey uh, revealed a dubious distinction for Fort Worth. Um, that 2013 data showed that Fort Worth's um, well-being score placed us at almost the very bottom of large metro areas. And when I say the very bottom, I mean 185th out of 190. Um, so not the place that we wanted to be. And let me just add that there is a real cost to poor health. There's a cost to individuals, there's a cost to businesses, healthcare systems, insurers, taxpayers. There's a cost to all of us when our community is not well. But four years later, um, our city's rank increased from 185th to then 58th place. And then most recently in 2019, our well-being score tied Fort Worth for 31st place among large metro areas. So firmly in the top 20% and um, on par with the Austin Round Rock um, well-being so score as well. So again, tremendous improvements to uh, health and well-being in that time frame. The outcomes you gave are just tremendous there. I mean, that's significant in a four or five year period, significant. So 
as we talk about this, can we drill down a little bit and expand a little more on some of the initiatives and how would these initiatives reach some of the people in our listening audience? Well, I, I'll share a couple of stories because I think that's where this becomes real. Again, Blue Zones Project is a community-wide health and well-being initiative. But at the end of the day, we are impacting our residents um, and our communities as a whole, but also individuals. Um, I always like to share the story of Roxanne, Roxanne Martinez and the work that we're doing in Diamond Hill, a neighborhood in Fort Worth. And what you've seen happen over the course of this time frame is parents are now walking instead of sitting in a chair while their kids are doing their athletic exercises. During the practices, the students are drinking water. They're having healthy snacks like fruit rather than some of the snacks that they had before. Residents and the seniors are actually doing walking groups at the senior center. Um, and we just piloted one of our healthy fruit carts at this same location. So rather than kids going and buying candy and um, ice cream from a mobile cart, they're now buying fresh fruit. Those are real and lasting changes. But again, that's where it really gets real for an individual, the kids, families in that neighborhood. You know, Thomas, what a great segment on the Blue Zone. And that's a great way to end the show great work they're doing in Fort Worth to improve the health of the community. You know, we're going to move into looking at next week. And to be candid, we got some great segments, but this virus is creating change quickly within the Metroplex. So you know what, Thomas, next week's show is yet to be determined, but we're going to bring the very latest to our listeners. And the human side of healthcare is going to keep you up to date with the very latest. I had no idea when we put this show together that we would be covering this, <laughs> but we are and we will. So yes, whatever is unfolding, we will be on top of it. And when we don't have that, then we have some other great news going on that will be great to talk about instead of coronavirus. Absolutely. And won't that be a pleasant day when that occurs? All right. The human side of healthcare will be back next week. One o'clock here on KRLD.